Good afternoon. How are we today? Good afternoon. We're good. Good, good. So as mentioned, my name is Joe Black. I work with the Central Promise Neighborhood, and I have the lucky honor to be here with you today for our annual address to the State of the War Ward 5. I am proud to say that as a homeowner in the community, as an individual who works in the neighborhood, and as an advocate for this community, we should be proud to be here today and celebrate the many successes of our community. With that being said, I would ask if Ms. Mildred Lowe would come up and do the invocation and get us started, and we will go from there. <laughs> I, got so, I got surprised too. You get a surprise too. All right. I'm so loud, you can hear me, right? <laughs> First, I would just like to thank our Heavenly Father. I know we're of different religious persuasions. persuasions. I'll get the right that Rolodex is so slow in my mind. But I just would like to thank our Heavenly Father for allowing us to come together today to be here in this wonderful building and to praise his name and thank him for getting us all here together so that we can hear a report from our community so that we can do all that we can to be better citizens and just to thank him for this day, the sunshine and the ability to get here today. And thank you for all who took the time out from their busy day to be part of what's going to move this ward forward. And Heavenly Father, we just like to thank you for being here today. We praise your name. We thank you for the gift of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 That was good. That was good. Thank you for allowing us to call on you at this moment. We greatly appreciate that. So before we get into a formal introduction of our councilwoman, I want to take an opportunity to just share why I am here before you and our goals and objectives for today. So many of you may know me from a variety of different experiences. I sit on the board of commissioners for CMHA. I work for the Sisters of Charity Foundation, focusing on education in our very own community. My work even date backs to university settlement, supporting youth in the schools, dealing with different issues. I believe in the war. I'm invested in the war. And I know many of you are as well. With that being said, our, our opportunities are also faced with many challenges. I see those and I understand it is our collective effort to address that. We come here to unite to celebrate, but we must also come here to unite to work. Our councilwoman has the opportunity to lead us in that effort and many others must do the same to support. With that being said, I wanna also take the opportunity to announce and recognize many of the elected officials in the room Majority Whip, Blaine Griffin, Ward 6. <laughs> Joseph Jones, Ward 1. <laughs> Judge Ron O'Leary, Cleveland Housing Court. <laughs> Kevin Conwell, Ward 6. Ward 9, excuse me, I know that I live. Excuse me, Ward 9, excuse me. <laughs> and State Senator Sandra Williams. Thank you each and every one of you, not only for being present with us today, but also for committing to your communities and the city as a whole. With that being said, I also have the luxury of bringing forward our councilwoman, Mrs. Phyllis Cleveland. With that being said. I know, right? Let's let's do that again. Yay, Phil. As a resident of our community, lifelong practically, moving here at an early age and residing within a four block radius. Councilwoman Cleveland has worked to serve our community in a variety of different ways. As the majority leader for city council, she pushes for us in many ways, fighting for different legislative, legislative options and opportunities that we have in front of us. Things like the right to counsel, 
other opportunities that exist in front of us today are all a result of her hard work. I also note that in many cases, from my own personal experience, it is not just what you see is done, it's also what you see that is not allowed to happen. Advocacy works in both ways. And I see that and I appreciate that. So as a friend, as a community leader, I gladly bring before you our city councilwoman, Ms. Phyllis Cliff. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me adjust the. I think I'm supposed to stay behind the speaker, so. I may deviate, but uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I had a couple of glitches this morning. Uh, number one is um, in, in getting some printed materials out. Uh, it didn't work, so I don't have them, but uh, I will provide them to you at a later point. So if everyone who's, you know, please sign in if you want to get a copy of my remarks and what our agenda would have been for today, and I will get that to you um, as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I also intended to print up my remarks, and that didn't work, and so I'm working from my iPad. And I'm, I'm fairly tech, tech savvy, but I've never done this and worked from an iPad, so uh, bear with me. And before I get started, um, just a couple of things I want to do to set the tone. Uh, this is our annual State of the Ward. Uh, I probably didn't do one last year, but um, I can't remember. But um, And so what I'm going to do is just share with you my reflections on the work that we did in the past year and where we're headed in the future. You know, um, the good things and the challenges that we faced as well. And so. Um, now, I'll share with you my, my work, my view, um, you know, what the results have been and, and uh, what I project going forward. And we're not going to do a, a Q&A session today. You know, uh, that's not what the state of the board is. So, you know, this will be my narrative. And so I hope nobody takes offense to that. But I do Q and A, you know, every month at War Club. You know, and you all wear me out. So, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I'll take this opportunity today to to um, move forward. And uh, um, one other thing, um, you know, this is a, a city event. It's not a political event. Um, so we've recognized elected officials, people who are holding office now. Uh, you know, we're not going to do candidates. You know, there are people in the room, and you know, you can do your thing. Out of the camera view, please, <laughs> uh, today. But, um, you know, so just understand that, uh, you know, why we're doing that this way today. Uh, you know, and I appreciate y'all for being here and, you know, coming to hear my state of the ward. Uh, one other thing, I, I would like to bring up Mr. Steve Friedman. Uh, he is with VGS, Vocational Guidance Service, and they have so willingly served as our host for our ward meetings. Um, how long? Going back to my, my, Monty, Monty Burton. So, you know, you, we're talking about, you know, the mid, you know, back to the 1980s. So they've been a good host and they are a great partner and a great provider in this community. So I want to bring up Mr. Friedman to say a couple of words. Thank you, fellas. Uh, this is something new for me, but for Vocational Guidance Service, we've been a neighbor, a part of the community reaching out. Um, Basically, it's a training programs and services that we offer to everyone. We are offering pre and post employment programs for those programs uh, with individuals with disability needs. Or if you have to reinvent yourself due to maybe you got hurt on a job somewhere else and you're, you need to change the type of employment. But it's going to be immediate for your goals. We have an active daycare uh, day service vocational habilitation services, career planning services, benefits, uh, non-medical transportation. We get you ready for the workplace, be it uh, earning a paycheck, learning, critical job keeping skills such as clerical, custodial, manufacturing, textile services, summer youth career exploration for the younger ones to see where they want to go with their goals individual employment support, and again, non-medical transportation. 
So when this comes into this education, what are the skills and training that we offer? Well, we will give you the tools needed to obtain employment, and those tools will be hands-on. Work experience, instruction relevant to your curriculum. So you may be working with building maintenance we offer, customer service, computer skills, custodial services, food services, forklift training, textile services, GED classes, and again, helping with non-medical transportation. So we offer all these career services to our neighbors, to those that are outreaching, to give them a new direction, a hope that it's not over if you have to make any changes. Because we are designed to help from youth to adult to learn effective techniques. We have community-based work experience, community-based work adjustment programs, like I said before, youth work experience, job searching skills and training, job searching skills for job placement. We also offer job coaching, individual employment supports, something very simple as reinventing yourself with your resume. So with this, we offer workforce solutions for everyone. So our solutions include on-site supervised works, in-house manufacturing, and more. Again, what you see around you in this building is food service production. We offer manufacturing across the street. We have the sewing production up top that we uh, have been with many years, and packing and assembly. VGS is the neighborhood. VGS is the community, and that's only because of all of you. And we thank you and all that are in Ward 5 and giving the opportunity with uh, Phyllis uh, with this opportunity. So we thank you, and we appreciate being part of the neighborhood. Thank you, Steve. Okay, also I'd like to... Uh, acknowledge a couple of other people um, who are in the room right now. Uh, one of those, he's out of uniform. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Patterson, he's the CEO of CMHA Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. Yep. And as you all know, um, we have, I think, a third of, of all public housing in, in the city is right here in Ward 5, uh, most of it in the central community. And so I have the opportunity and have the, had the opportunity to, to work with Mr. Patterson for many, many years. Um, and you know we have a great working relationship and I think we've done a lot of good work together that we can be proud of. So thank you for being here, Jeff. And also want to acknowledge Mr. Earl Pike. Wait, Earl. Earl is a, a longtime servant in our community in the nonprofit world, and he is currently the executive director of University Settlement. Uh, he came on about a year, was it a year? Two years, of, two years ago. And he just came in and hit the ground running and, and doing some great, fantastic work in, in the uh, North Broadway and throughout the Slavic Village community. So Earl, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all you do. And I'll talk a little more about um, uh, your big project uh, shortly. Uh, uh, okay, I think that's it right now. Other people may walk in and, you know, uh, once I start flowing, if the spirit hits me, I will acknowledge them. Um, you know, I may, you know, shout out some people in the room already, you know, um, you know that's how it's gonna flow, so thank you. Um, and I will say a, a special thank you to uh, one of my BFF, FFs, uh, Cheryl, wave your hand. She uh, introduced me at one of my previous State of the Ward addresses uh, a few years ago, and you know we go back a few years um, since we're probably what somewhere around seven or eight years old. So when you can have friends that you know that long, you know you know they're real friends. So thank thanks for being here always. You know, I'm, Love you to pieces. Okay, now, State of the War. Well, again, I said thank you for attending my State of the War. Uh, I have been privileged to represent War 5 uh, for 14 years now. Uh, I was first elected in 2005. Uh, took office in 2006 and 
That's a long time. And it's like dog years. <laughs> and I'm only half joking. <laughs> but it, you know, it's because it's hard work and it's serious work. And uh, my colleagues here can attest to you know, how much of uh, a, a really a, a sacrifice and, and a grind that it really is. A lot of you see us on TV, you see ribbon cuttings, or you see us at, a, at, at the scene of an accident. And people think that, you know, we, we, that we're TV actors. You know, that we play characters on TV and we show up, you know, we just show up and then the rest of the time we go somewhere and hide. And it's not like that at all. It is not like that at all. This is pure service, pure hard work. The people that we represent need so much, they have great needs for a number of reasons. And they look to us to fulfill those needs. And that plays out in the number of calls that we get per day. Um, at, at the peak season, which is summer, you know, we're looking at somewhere between 50, 100, 100 calls a day or more. And that's serious. And, and, and now with, you know, the advent of email and, and email being so, you know, so prolific, um, we, we may get that many emails as well. And then people reach out to us on social media. You know, um, you know, I have people who hit me on Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram, and I don't really fool with Snapchat, but uh, you know, people try to contact me there as well. But people will try to reach you wherever they can reach you. And again, uh, a lot of people have great needs, and they look to us, you know, government at the eyeball level, to help them. You know, we're the most accessible. We're the closest to them. We're the closest to the ground. We live where they live. We shop where they shop. We go to the barber shops and the nail shops and the beauty shops that they go to, and they see us every day. And so, and, and they're not afraid to approach us. They may be a little hesitant to walk up on the congresswoman, um, and Senator Williams. I don't know if people walk up on you a lot, but um, <laughs> when it comes to us, you know, you know, we're we're there, and it's like you, you, you know, you're my representative. And for whatever government need it is, it's not just the city. If they have an issue with, I have people come to me with issues with the IRS, the Social Security, uh, with their VA benefits, uh, with their food stamps, you name it. They come to us first because they expect that we can help them. And it's not necessarily our world, but you know we do all that we can to help. So that means I've got to connect them to you know, the state or to the, the VA or whatever agency it is or you know, help them find the help that they need. So um, it, it's truly a grind, but it's also a privilege. You know, God doesn't place anyone in these positions, you know, haphazardly. You know, he put us there because he knew that we were the ones who cared and we were the ones who were going to do the hard work. You know, everybody doesn't do it that way. Everybody doesn't see it that way. So I, I just want you to, you know, know you know, where I come from. You know, I still have some pretty vivid memories and I'm getting to where I'm going. Uh, you know, my first year in council and that, that was really hard, you know, and honestly, there, I didn't think I would make it through the year. I really didn't. It, it was just uh, the craziest, hardest thing I got myself into. And, you know, I worked in the county and, you know, when the county is like sword fighting, you know, you know, like very polite and, and I got to the city, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. You know, this is not what I do, but you know, you, you learn very quickly or you, or you get eaten up. And so I, and I, and I did. And, I, and those of you who've been around also know that, you know, for me, it was also a very hard year because I lost my mother that same year. And I know um, my colleague, Kevin Con Conwell, has a similar experience. And it's just the hardest thing. You turn your life upside down to enter into a public elected office and then, you know, have you know, a big part of your foundation ripped away from you. You know, it, it's very hard. It was very hard. And again, I just, you know, a lot of days I didn't know how or if I would make it. But uh, here I am. Here I am. And a big part of that is because public service, I think, is what I was born to do, what I was put on earth to do. And not necessarily, you know, as a council person, but ever since I was a kid, you know, I always found myself helping people. And by the time I was a teenager, I was helping older adults. I, I helped my mother when she had 
stuff to do and, and business to transact with Social Security or some other organization. Um, other relatives and friends, you know, again, they brought things to me to help them figure out. And so it, it's, it's just what I did. And um, at the age of 21, I actually started working for the federal government for the Social Security Administration. And so that really made me um, the personal representative for a lot of older relatives. Uh, one of my aunts, you know, whenever they, uh, she and her friends had a discussion about Social Security, she said, well, you need to talk to my niece. You talk to my niece. And so uh, I spent a, big, you know, a, a lot of time doing that. But again, I, I felt that was a privilege. That was a privilege. You know, if I wasn't there, then maybe there wouldn't be somebody there who would care enough to take the time and listen and work through and walk through what they needed to walk through. But again, you know, coming to council, uh, you become the, the center and the focus of other people's desires and their needs and their adoration and their hate. You know, it comes with the territory. And, amen, <laughs> <laughs> Judge Gail Williams Byers <laughs> has entered the room. So thank you, Judge, thank you for being here. And you know, Gail's my girl, okay? Oh. I, I just have to say that. That's, so, um, you know, I wasn't used to the politics part, but I was used to the governance and the service. And so it, it took some time and again, I didn't think I'd make it, but um, thank God I did. I, I, matter of fact, thank you, Jesus, I did. Amen. <laughs> please bear with me, because I, I, I usually do paper. I, I, don't, I don't like this um, when it comes to speaking. There's a, a few other things, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I got to give you some background because some of you know me from way back and others, you know, don't know my story. And I, I think you need to know my story to understand what I do and why I do it and why I do it the way I do it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a central girl. I've lived in central just, a, just about my entire life, um, uh, all but four years. Um, before that, we lived on army bases, you know, for four years. I lived in Hawaii and Massachusetts and Fort Knox, Kentucky, and Fort Devens, Massachusetts. But again, all of that was until I was before I was four years old, so I don't remember none of that now. But uh, you know, Cleveland is what I know, and Cleveland is a part of me. And so I, I've lived in the same four block radius. Um, Joe mentioned that. Started out on the East 40th Street in the old Carver Park, Mr. Patterson, uh, in the row houses. I went to R.B. Hayes School, right on the corner of 40th and Central. You know, probably many of you in the room don't even know, um, never heard of it. Uh, it, had, it burned down the year after I graduated from sixth, no, the, the summer after I graduated from sixth grade, and I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> I was babysitting that summer. It wasn't me. And I think the statute of limitations had expired. Though. And then uh, from there, uh, you know, I, most of you know, I spent the majority of my life in Longwood. And you know I'm a Longwood girl through and through, proud of it. Um, and I lived in Longwood for 35 years. And you know I'm not even that you know that old. And I lived in Longwood 35 years. So. <laughs> and then uh, I bought a house. I was blessed to be able to buy a house in 2000. And I moved right across the street from Longwood. So I stayed in the same neighborhood. You know, but it's where I wanted to be. It's really where I wanted to be. And I felt that I was destined to be there. I had a lot of opportunities to move out and go to the suburbs. Everybody said, move, you need to move. Um, you know, by then I had gone to college, gotten my Bachelor of Arts in English, and I got my law degree. And you know, people were like, you need to move. My father was definitely, you know, you need to, you, you need to be out of there. You know, um, he was concerned for our safety and our well-being, but um, I lived in a, in, a, in a good part of the neighborhood with good neighbors, great neighbors, and people watched my back and so, uh, and I never wanted to leave. Um, I went through and I looked at houses all over, uh, even bid on a couple of houses and I think the Lord was looking out because, you know, those things, they didn't work out. You know, Cheryl, she went through that with me. And I finally looked up on a house one day um, and uh, it, it belonged to the parents of my friend Juan, Juan Elliott. Is Juan still here? He's in the back of the room. You know, I, I bought his parents' house and it was just, to me it was a castle because it, uh, it was my own, but it was in my own neighborhood as well. 
and it allowed me to be that example I wanted to be for the younger people to say, it doesn't matter where you live, because people would tell you that, but I'm proof of it. It doesn't matter where you live. I went to Case Western Reserve. Well, I went to Brandeis University out of high school, out of East Tech. That's in Massachusetts. Uh, came back home, I went to Case Western Reserve. I got a Bachelor of Arts, I mentioned, and a law degree, all when I lived at 2553 East 38th Street in Longwood, so. You, you tell somebody. And I really felt I had a, a special calling or destiny to um, improve the neighborhood I grew up in. I, I believe that uh, Bible, the Bible um, saying, to those who much is given, much is required. And I, you know, it, it was just embedded in my heart. And so, you know, I came up in Central in a time where there had been no investment and no development in Central in probably decades. Well, in decades. And, and I would say, I would guess to say probably the 30s or 40s. Nothing was put in the central. Everything was taken out from that point on. People moved out. Um, the people with jobs and, and businesses moved out. Um, properties were torn down. You know, the freeway system was built. And the freeway, you know, cut off the community and isolated the neighborhood, you know, from the lifeblood of the city. And that was a conscious policy decision. You know, just like redlining, just like blockbusting and the other things we hear about, that's a very strong example of policy made at the federal and local and state level that impacted our lives in a negative way and was de designed to do so. But, um, and, and I grew up in the Central in a time where nobody believed in Central, except for the people that lived in Central, except for the people that lived there. And there were some great people, you know, we know there's some great people from the community. Um, our own Carl and Louis Stokes, um, you know, Mayor Stokes, um, and Judge, uh, he, Mayor Stokes also became a judge, but uh, Congressman Louis Stokes, you know, was still very involved in the community up until the end. Um, he had a, a very strong affinity for Alpha Day Bennett, which was renamed, uh, no, I'm sorry, for Central, which was renamed Carl and Louis Stokes Academy. And when the school district decided to close the schools, he decided, well, well, I don't want my name on the, on the building. I don't know what you're going to do unless he told me, uh, I'll leave it to you, you know, but if it's something good for the community and if it's educational, you can use our name, but otherwise take my name off of it. But he cared so much for the community and he and uh, the Honorable Judge Sarah Harper, you know, and they were all from Althwaite and Judge Sarah Harper opened a children's library in the Althwaite Community Center. And again, um, they both advocate strongly for the residents and the children of Alphalete. And so we have some, you know, again, strong people from the community. Um, my judge, Judge Jean Merle Capers, who passed away two years ago at the age of 104? I think 104. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, as you know, she was a city council member uh, elected in the 1940s, and then she later served as a municipal judge. You know, great, great lady. And for me, it, it, I still can't, I can't, I never could have imagined as a child that I would grow up one day and work with people like that that I looked up to. And so uh, it was something. And then, of course, there's Lonnie Burton. <laughs> If you all don't know about Lonnie Burton, you need to look him up and read his story. Lonnie was, um, he was something. And he was a different kind of dude. He, he was a real different kind of dude. Um, Lonnie would walk around sometimes in the summertime with a long black coat and black boots. And, you know, he would walk around the neighborhood and he would talk to people and he would tell you what was on his mind and what he was thinking. And I used to think, you know, initially, as you know, he kind of scared me. <laughs> so this, you know, this dude is a little too much for me. But when you talk to him, you really got to understand, you know, he was a real intellectual. He was a public intellectual. He was an academic intellectual. And he was a visionary. And he was one of the first people who went around this neighborhood to people who were still homeowners and said, don't sell your property. And if you can, buy some of this vacant land that's here now. Because one day it's going to be worth something. Because, you know, 
this is valuable land that we sit on. This is prime land. And everybody that grew up in Central knew, we grew up knowing that we sat on prime land. And that, you know, they wanted our land. Uh, Y'all know who they is. Y'all know. And so we grew up knowing that. And so, um, you know, what Lonnie started to do was to really codify that belief that Central is ours. And for it to be ours, we needed to control the land and we needed to make decisions and determine our own destiny. And he was the first to really plant that seed. And unfortunately, of course, you know, he died, you know, way too soon and way too young. But he saw what this community could become. And fortunately, uh, you know, one of his disciples came along and, and took up the mantle, Frank Jackson. And so the things that the, the mayor was able to carry out as councilman, uh, consolidating land uh, into the hands of uh, the community by way of uh, the Community Development Corporation, Burton Bell Carr. Hi, Tim. And, and Tim wasn't there at that time, but, um, but again, you know, he, he, he put in place the, the mechanism so that we could control that property. And then and ultimately, you know, what we have now is a uh, rebuilt central community. Uh, our public housing is central, you know, it, for the most part, it looks great. It is great. I was in Altoid the other day, Mr. Patterson, and they keep saying, what about us? What about us? <laughs> but I, I know you're doing Woodhill right now in, in Ward 6 and my colleague, Bert, um, <laughs> Lane Griffin's ward, but uh, Altoid said, don't forget about us. But again, most of the public housing, you, you look at King Kennedy, um, uh, New Carver, um, and now uh, Sankofa, which used to be Cedar Extension. You know, the, the public housing is very high quality, very well done, and, and it looks nice. It looks, um, Heritage View, I'm sorry, I forgot them, the Old Garden Valley. There you go, Ms. Fain. <laughs> you know, the, the public housing looks good, and, and it's, it goes to the belief that, you know, poor people deserve to live in good quality, Clean, safe, dry housing like anyone else. And, and thank you to Mr. Patterson um, for sharing that belief and championing that, that belief. And so, you know, I come from a time and a place where community meant everything. You know, family, neighborhood, school, church, business. Um, they're all connected and all dependent on each other for survival. And when one of those links is weakened, what used to happen is that the other links kind of filled in the gap. But today, in many of our communities, you know, all of the links are weakened. You know, the family is struggling. The neighborhoods are struggling. The schools are struggling. Uh, the churches are struggling. And a lot of our businesses are, are, aren't doing well also. And so we're at a time where we are forced to reconnect the links. It's time for us to repair and strengthen and recreate the social, cultural, and economic fabric of our communities. We don't, if we don't do that, then we're doomed. Then we are doomed. And there's, there's no other way to say it. This, this city will be doomed. And don't take it for granted that everyone is of the same mind and everyone wants to see the city grow and thrive for everyone. Because that's not true. There are a lot of people who are making a lot of money off of poverty and sickness and illness and crime. There are a lot of people. And so while ostensibly um, they say the right things, you look at you know what, what they're doing and some decisions that are being made and some of the other things that are happening will, will show you that uh, they're not acting in, in the best interest of the city of Cleveland. They're acting in their own best interest. And so it's time for us to come together and do what we need to do across all neighborhoods, across all wards, to make sure that our city not only survives, but thrives. Our children need us to do that. Now, one of the biggest uh, issues 
and obstacles that we have right now in the city is the safety. Now, we had a horrendous September, horrendous. There were 21 murders and numerous shootings and other other stabbings and, and violent attacks perpetrated by one member of the community on another. And the people committing the crimes are getting younger and younger. You know, we're seeing children do things that, you know, we never would have imagined. And one of the most frequent questions I get asked, when, you know, when I'm out and about or in, in the meeting in, in this room is, you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, Councilman Jones, one of the first things I say to her, number one, I don't have a badge and a gun, but I work very closely with the people who do. I work very closely with the people who do. And I want to say uh, a shout out to our police officers here in the room. I'm Lieutenant from the 4th District, and we have our community engagement officers uh, from the 3rd District. And Malcolm, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to give you a little special shout out. Um, uh, Malcolm Sutton Nichols, can you stand up just for a moment? Now let me tell you, let me tell you who Malcolm's mother is, Jackie Sutton. So Malcolm, I think he lives in War Six with he, uh, once, you, War Seven. Seven, but he's still on the bus. You know, as you all know, Jackie was the mayor's longtime assistant, and also um, she leads the mayor's action center now in taking citizen complaints. So, uh, but Malcolm Ryan, uh, attended all of you, thank you so much. Uh, but um, so the first step is, you know, with, with crime, it, it starts with police, and it doesn't end there, but it starts there. And this is where all the technology really started to start to mess up. But the first line, you know, in terms of crime in the streets, um, you know, the first stop is law enforcement. Um, I encourage everyone in this room, if you see something, say something. That's been the common mantra. You know, we have a, a, a code among some people in our community, a, a code of silence, you know, the no snitching or, you know, you go in your house and close your curtains and it's not my business as long as it's not in, you know, on my doorstep, but one day it will be on your doorstep. And, you know, who's gonna help you? So the first stop, step is see something, say something. Um, um, the other thing is um, I wanna ever advocate is that every police district has a community relations board and it's there and it's designed to foster good relationships between the community and the police department. And we know we, we've had some issues over the past few years, but we have been working on those issues through our the consent decree that the city entered into with the Department of Justice to make some major reforms in the Cleveland Division of Police. And those things include um, the screening process, determining who gets hired to be a police officer, um, how they're trained, what type of training, um, there's an emphasis on bias-free bias -free policing, and that means you know trying to take the subjective elements out of out of police work. Um, you know, sometimes people have conceptions or stereotypes about people in certain neighborhoods. You know, based on you know the space of skin color and, and what they know and what they see. And so, you know, we're training police officers today to be better judges of uh, what's going on in the neighborhood, and not to judge so much by by race. But, but learn to pick up other things that are indicators of crime or indicators of what's going on in the neighborhood. And so the consent decree is you know, one of those tools that you know, we are using to reform the police department and have better trained, better motivated police officers on our streets. Um, one of the other, there are a couple other things going on too. Um, you know, technology is really important in law enforcement. Um, we have shot sensor, what is shot spot? Gun sensor technology. Gun sensor technology, okay. Now what that is, is it's a type of software that can, you know, when shots are fired in a particular area, the software can detect where the shots originated and get that information to the police and then the police can go to that area and, and do what they need to do. 
I mean, they still have to investigate. They still have to come out and do their physical uh, uh, look at, and look and see what's going on. But it's a great tool because I can tell you now, I, I hear gunshots a lot, um, you know, in my neighborhood. But I can't always tell where they came from. I'm thinking, okay, it sounded like over here. Yeah. And my daughter said, well, I thought it came from over there. And, and so you can call the police and say, well, I heard shots, but I really don't know where they came from. But with the, the technology, you know, they can detect, the, the technology can pinpoint where the shots came from. And that's a big help and a big leg up to the officers um, when they investigate a call about shooting. You know, another thing is that the city is installing LED lights throughout the city. Um, you may have heard about that in the news. And so those LED lights are wonderful. In fact, you know, to some people, they're too good because they, you know, they, they, they light up your house, you know, and um, you know, some people complain they can't sleep you know, the lights in their bedroom or, you know, it messes with your TV and things like that. But so, you know, we're, they're working on making adjustments, but it, it's, it's a great, great tool because most criminals don't operate in the light. You know, they operate in the dark where they can't be seen, which makes sense. And so, you know, uh, um, the lights are being rolled out, you know, uh, in a couple of neighborhoods at a time. And ultimately, uh, finally, uh, the um, lights will be throughout the city. Um, the other thing people um, are asking about are surveillance cameras. And you may have heard about that as well, um, you know, in the news. And, um, you know, what we got is a, a camera program that's going to roll out over the next five years. And it's going to roll out in three phases. And the initial phase with the cameras were, um, they were centered around city infrastructure, meaning around city property and buildings. And so, you know, a lot of us, a lot of our colleagues, we had questions and issues about that. And, but I, I can understand because the infrastructure is there, you don't have to build it. Um, and you can place cameras on, on rec centers and city property, you know, with very little um, installation costs compared to where you're going to have to actually create a, a, a vehicle for the, the cameras to go to. And initially I had a problem because I was looking at the, you know, well, the rec centers and, and this and that, but, you know, what I really start to look at is not where the cameras were placed, but what the cameras will capture. And then I realized uh, I was looking at the list in Ward 6, the Fairfax Recreation Center. All your cameras point to my ward. <laughs> so I'm good with that. I am real good with that. So, um, you know, you hear a lot of fussing and, uh, you know, from our, our colleagues, and that happens all the time, you know, because we like to fuss. Uh, but, you know, uh, just understand that, you know, this is just the initial rollout. Um, again, they're going to, and the initial rollout, I think it's 1,100 cameras. So, um, the second and third phases of those cameras will be going in other locations. Um, you know, and those are locations that we help select based on what you, the residents, told us you, where you need cameras and where things are happening and where you have dark spots and hidden spots. And so, but, um, you know, these are all the tools, um, you know, a highly trained police force, uh, the latest technology, uh, state-of-the-art lights and cameras, and then collaboration among law enforcement. Um, we have the strike force that's been created where Cleveland police and all of the other major law enforcement agencies, you know, the, the ABCs of law enforcement, um, ATF, um, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, uh, I think the DEA, the drug enforcement um, agency, let's see, okay, help me out with the yeah. FBI, Department of Justice, you know, are all working together to deal with the the crime and the violence that's happening in the community. And so, again, you got collaboration, technology, highly skilled, highly trained uh, police force. But we know that deals with you know, crime once it happens, for the most part. Uh, we also have to look at the, the prevention side. And the reality is, you know, crime is a symptom. You know, crime doesn't exist in and of itself by itself. It's a symptom of greater problems in society, uh, systemic racism, um, poverty, and, and those things. And so until we are able to really effectively deal with those things, you know, you're always going to have crime. You're always going to have problems. And so we've got to balance um, law enforcement, strong, vigorous law enforcement, which I do support. And I think most people uh, in the community do support. But you've got to balance that with uh, prevention, 
prevention methods and also um, trying to deal effectively with conditions in our communities. And so, um, and to that end, you know, one of the things that the mayor is doing, um, has done, is uh, he's transforming our recreation centers um, from just places of play to, to holistic community centers. And what that means is that uh, each, rec each rec center will become a trauma center in, in, a, in its own right. They'll be staffed with counselors who are experienced at detecting kids who are suffering from trauma, and probably adults too, and helping connect them with the help that they need. You know, a lot of people, that's where they spend their time. A lot of kids, they spend time in, in those rec centers. And so those are the people who will naturally spot where the problems are. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that the mayor has come up with. Um, we've got a program working with the Department of Justice that, that'll be implemented in the central neighborhood. Um, it's in its planning phases right now, and it's gonna be rolled out, I think, next year. So as I get more information to share with you, I will share that with you. Um, we also have, um, you know, others who work in the community all the time. Uh, uh, community relations, on uh, our community relations board, we have um, members who work with young people in the community. You know, they're on the ground with them every day. Um, you know, when they're, uh, during school times, you know, they're there just, um, when they get out of school, when they're going to school, and sometimes in the schools. And during vacation times, they work with them in the neighborhood. And so they get to know the young people and they help connect them with services that they need. And I know CMHA has the program, uh, the PAR program, the Police Assistance Referral Program. When CMHA police make a call to a house, they may come and see that, well, you know, there, there's no food in the refrigerator or there's no furniture in the home. So they could connect that family with the help that they need. And so um, we have the Peacemakers Alliance and the Peacemakers have sort of changed their mission. And so now they're working um, more on a case management model and they're meeting young people, you know, in emergency rooms, you know, when they're getting shot. And so they're going to the hospitals and, and they're based in the emergency rooms. And so they see a young, a young person who comes in who's been shot and was suspected to be a, a gang type activity. And so they can connect with the young person right then and there. And then try to help them and connect them again with the services they need. So it's, it's taking an all around approach, an all around approach. And so, um, so when people ask me what you're doing about it, you know, uh, they get the long answer. You know, I'm, I'm doing what I can, but um, this is what's happening out here and what you gonna do? What you gonna do? It's gonna take all of us, you know. Yeah. I'm one person and I can't take on all of the, the, the um, global economic problems that the world has created, but I'm gonna do my part, but we all have to do ours. And we have to come, become again the community we used to be. We looked out for each other, we had each other's back, and we did what we could, not only for that individual, but for the good of the community. You know, we had a community standard and a community ethic. And it, it's no longer there, Ms. Lowe, right? It's no longer there. So that's, that's crime. Uh, one of the other big issues that uh, we, we're facing in Ward 5, uh, many of you know that we lost our grocery store. And again, that's one of the biggest, the uh, second most frequently asked question. Sometimes the most frequently asked question, you know, when are we going to get another store? And I would love to say tomorrow, but, you know, it's not that easy. Um, you know, and seriously, what happened is that, um, you know, Dave's made a business decision. Dave's is a, is a family business. They made a decision that was in the best interest of their family. And I'm not mad at them for that, but it was a big hurt to the community. You know, to Arbor Park and the surrounding central community, but also to, you know, the pain community. St. Clair Superior and, and people that went to the pain store. And so, um, what I will tell you is that, oh, my timekeeper just hit me. And I'm just getting started. <laughs> But um, uh, what I would tell you is that we are working very hard to get a grocery store back in Arbor Park Plaza. Uh, Mr. Trammell and I, um, you know, we know how important it is to the community. Um, you know, there's um, no other store that sells fresh produce, um, fresh meat, nutritious food that a Dave's or another grocery store sells. You know, we've got many dollar stores 
we got a proliferation of dollar stores throughout our community. And it's, you know, they serve their purpose, but it, but um, they, they also create a, a lot of problems as well. Um, because uh, quite frankly, they're robbery magnets. You know, people, that seems to be, you know, their target practice for, you know, armed robberies. Um, they sell a lot of unhealthy food. Um, and it's cheap, so people are tempted, you know, to make their dollars go farther, and so they, they go there. And I understand. I understand when you, you can't go somewhere else and you don't have enough, you know, money or you don't have transportation to go somewhere else, then you do that. So, um, I know my, uh, my colleague, Councilman Griffin, um, had proposed doing a moratorium on dollar stores in our neighborhood. And, and not that we, we're trying to get rid of all of them, but we just don't want to have so many. You know, because it also makes it difficult to get a grocery store. Um, because, yeah, they, 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 they keep grocery stores from coming in the neighborhood. And so, but we are working on that. And um, I know Tim is, is very determined, and I am determined that we will get a store. I can't give you the time, you know, time limit, time frame, and we can't give out names. You know, you can't name who you're negotiating with or talking to. So, uh, but just know that we are working on that. Um, I'm very concerned about it. Um, you know, and I, honestly, I miss the store. That's where I saw everybody. That's where I started. You know, I could run around the corner and, you know, get a couple of things. And, but I knew I was guaranteed to run into people. And, and that was important because, uh, you know, it, it kept me connected. And people let me know what was on their minds um, about other things. And so, again, that Dave's was also a, a community gathering place. You know, and it also, you know, we, uh, and if we need it, we need the rent at the Arbor Park Plaza. <laughs> Quite frankly, so. Okay, now there's a couple other things um, I really need to share with you. You know, uh, this council, this session has really done some heavy legislative work, you know, and that's really, you know, what our, our primary function is. Although we get to do other things and we will continue to do other things, uh, you know, we have a very serious charge to be the legislators and policy makers you know, for the city of Cleveland. And just, I want to mention just a couple of things that we, um, this, this council has passed. And one is a, a right to counsel for eviction hearings. You know, right now, if you go and sit in 3A eviction court, you know, you'll see a, a packed room every day. And you'll see landlords and property owners who have lawyers and residents who are in danger of being evicted. Most of them, women with children with no lawyers. And you know, you know, the deck, is, the deck is stacked when that happens. And that's not to say there's something underhanded, but you know, you can't go into a courtroom with somebody who's represented by a lawyer and expect to be, uh, to have a fair shot. It, it just doesn't happen. And what we found, you know, Legal Aid um, uh, did research and found that out of, you know, an average of 9,000 evictions over the past few years, about 60% 60 60 of those were women with children, you know, who are, again, about to lose their housing. So um, New York and a, few, a couple of other cities are doing some work uh, and have actually, you know, come up with right to counsel laws. And, and so, and, you know, I'm really glad we took that project on and I can give a shout out to my, my, my sister friend, uh, Judge Gail williams Byers. Um, you know, she was, you know, very involved in doing some research, research and working with some, um, some folks from George Washington University. And so she's linking, up, linking us up with some resources to help make that uh, a stronger reality. We've already passed the legislation. we got to find a way to pay for it now. <laughs> Lead, another, another big issue, another big nut that this council... Um, um, uh, pass this this legislate this this term, and uh, my colleague Blaine Griffin. I'm saying your name a lot, Blaine. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I work with all my colleagues, um, but um, we passed legislation um, in September um, to ensure that um, eventually every child in this community will live in a lead, lead safe property. You know, lead free, we, we can't guarantee, but a lead safe property. And so it's gonna take some steps and it's gonna take some work and it also takes some funding because you know, we're not trying to burden landlords and property owners, but uh, we know the damage that lead poisoning does to children under the age of six. You know, and that, 
that, that damage can be lifelong. And some of the problems that we see with crime and some of the irrational crime happening in our community, uh, I, I, I bet if you, those, those young people were tested, they will test you know, for, for lead poisoning in, in their bloodstream. And so it's a very, very, you know, very important, um, significant piece of legislation that we pass for our community. So again, um, great work and, uh, you know, led again by our, our colleague, um, Blaine Griffin in Ward 6. We've done some significant work on pre preventing and decreasing infant mortality as well. And again, that's you know, and that's another problem that impacts you know poor communities and 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 black babies in particular. And so, uh, again, uh, another you know big legislative coup for uh, Cleveland City Council. Um, one thing I do want to mention. Um, one other thing I do want to mention. Um, you know, there's some things going on. You know, we got an election coming up, November fifth, just in a couple of weeks. Um, I think everybody knows, you know, you've gotten stuff in the mail, you, you're getting campaign literature on your door and, and, and things like that. But uh, again, this is not political, so I'm not going to get into that. But what I can get into is to encourage everyone here to vote for Tri-C on the, on the ballot. <laughs> they have a, you know, they have to... Um, come back to the voters every four years to get their levy renewed. And so this is the year. What issue is that, Erica? Three, three, issue three. Three, three. So I can't say it, vote for issue three. Right. Vote for issue three. You know, try to see, you know, it's one of the most important institutions, I think, uh, in the state of Ohio. In the state of Ohio. You know, they're, they're, you know, they have something for everyone. And so, and it's critical. We can't afford for them to lose one single penny in their mission in educating and retraining uh, our young people and workers in the community. So, Eric and, oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, Erica, thank you for being there. I know that, okay, they give me the, they trying to rush me, I'm, and I'm trying to rush. I know, I know, but, um, again, just stop by Erica's table, you know, get some literature, and be, and be sure and tell somebody to vote for issue three. And also, you know, stop by and get information from Mr. Friedman on, on VGS. I mean, he, he laid out a, a laundry list of things um, that VGS provides for the community, and they've got something for everybody. You know, he, he said, um, you know, coaching, and, and, and I'm thinking, uh, okay, that, that, that might be something good for me. Okay. But uh, there's another important issue coming up. Uh, it won't be on the November ballot, but, uh, you know, I've talked about it before at, at our war meetings, but, uh, it may be coming soon to a theater near you, and that's council reduction. There are people out here who are not Clevelanders, um, who are suburban business people, who have been circulating petitions to reduce the size of Cleveland City Council. And from what I hear, they have the signatures, or they're very close to getting the signatures that they need to force that issue on the ballot. Now, people are you know, upset and angry and frustrated about government and what it does and what, what it doesn't do. And so, you know, they, they sign, oh sure, I sign, yeah, well, we need to get rid of them. You know, and people don't think they're being uh, emotional and impulsive, you know. Uh, it's one thing, you know, if, you, if you're dissatisfied with, with your representative, then, you know, you work on getting rid of the representative. You don't do away with the representation at all together. Yeah, so again, you know, from what I'm hearing, it, it, it may be happening, um, you know, as early as the first quarter of next year. Um, and so we will, keep, we will all keep you posted on that. But it, it's very important because you got to look at who's behind something. When somebody brings an idea to you, you look at who it comes from. And someone who's, um, you know, rich suburban business person, are they acting in the best interest of the average citizen in the city of Cleveland? Oh, right, right. And so um, there may come a time when we have to fight that fight you know, and fight to maintain our representation. And what they're proposing is ridiculous. They're proposing cutting city council from 17 to nine. So that means, um, you know, even if you don't like me, you may get somebody 
Worse, sir. <laughs> Worse, sir. <laughs> yes, I mean, but um, you know, yeah, you don't know how. You know, we don't know how the words will be cut up. You know, I don't know if I'll be merged with Blaine and and, and Kevin Conwell, or you know, it may be with Ward Seven. We we have no idea, but you know. Most of us, you know, love or hate, we want our own councilman. Um, we want somebody who's closer to our community and understands our community and our needs and our neighborhoods. And so, um, so why would you vote to have less representation? You know, think about that. Think about that. And there's still our circulating petition. So if somebody comes to you with a petition and, um, Read what it says, number one, and if you don't understand what it says, don't sign it. Okay. You know, and the same going for that, you know, that utility stuff, you know. I don't even understand that, so I'm, no, I'm not signing nothing. I'm not signing nothing. Yeah, so, but, um, you know, please, you know, again, be, be alert, be aware. Uh, if it comes to pass, you know, it, it, it could be as early as next spring. Um, you know, we have a um, super, super, um, Tuesday in March, March 17th, yeah, St. Yeah, Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's yeah. Day next year. So, you know, it could, it could be then, it could be sooner from what I'm hearing, so um, we will keep you posted, but just understand that's coming, where it's coming from, and, and, you know, do the research yourself. And I think you come to the same conclusion, this is not in my best interest as a resident of the city of Cleveland. Um, couple other things and I just want to talk a, you know, a little bit more specifically about the war and I know they rushing me but um, you know I, as always you know they're, they're challenging things going on in the war we talked about crime you know we still have way too many vacant and abandoned houses although I will say that we've gotten we've had more vacant and abandoned houses torn down in Central and in Broadway over the last 10 years and then we've had several torn down in the Broadway neighborhood over the past year. Um, we have um, a couple of major coups. Um, if you all remember the Fresh Start property on East 55th, uh, hulking monster. You know, we, it, it was finally torn down in December and January, and so now we've got a nice, clean lot next to East Tech, and, and not that scary nuisance property. And, um, you know, we're, again, we're getting a lot of properties torn down. You know, one of the initiatives that, um, that we're doing with respect to demolition is the safe routes to schools. And so there's a preference and a priority on getting rid of the vacant and abandoned houses that are near and along school routes that our children walk to and from school every day. And so there's a real big emphasis on that. But uh, again, we are you know, working as hard as we can to make sure that every you know, vacant and abandoned property that is a nuisance gets torn down. Now, every property, every vacant property is not a nuisance. And some of them, you know, with a, a little bit of mothballing and some TLC can be uh, repurposed into a home for someone else. And we're not trying to get rid of those, but we try to preserve those and make sure that they're not, that they don't um, uh, deteriorate. Uh, thank you, thank you, <laughs> Magistrate Bodhi. Deteriorate, um, you know, any further. So uh, we work very hard to do that. And just with the sheer numbers involved, you know, it's very hard and it's very costly. And I think over the last, um, probably last um, nine or 10 years, we've easily spent somewhere in the area of, you know, 10 to $15 million on demolition of properties. <laughs> now, it, you know, you might say where, but, um, you know, it, it takes on average um, somewhere around eight to ten thousand dollars to demolish a, a, an average house. You know, if it's an extra large home, it costs more. And if it's a commercial industrial property, it really takes a significant amount of money to demolish. And so, the Fresh Start property here on Fifty Fifth, it, it it costs well over one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars when you include uh, remediating the asbestos from it. And so. Um, it's harder and harder to do those, but you know, we're working on that. Um, you know, one of the properties uh, in, in the Broadway neighborhood, um, right across from the Finn Cafe, um, uh, we just had a, a ribbon cutting for a new park there, Harding Park. And yeah, the city went in and cleaned it up. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge, a huge park that nobody used because 
a lot of people didn't even know it was there, number one, but it, it was just nothing there. And so there's some new swing sets. You know, they put down the new uh, ground and flooring so that kids, when they fall, they don't break their heads open. And, um, but we looked and there was this big atrocious building standing there right on the opposite of the, uh, of the park. And so, okay, we think a next move, okay, we gotta get this down. And not that I haven't been trying, but we really gotta get it down. If we're gonna put, invest money in a park, then you gotta get rid of all the nuisance around it. And fortunately, it was already in the works. And um, you know, Monday morning, Chris Alvarado and I were calling down to building and housing. And uh, lo and behold, it was already, you know, it's already um, on the calendar for design review because it has to go through a process. And it should be torn down probably, you know, right after the first few years. So uh, we are working on it, but you know, it's always, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, it's a financial challenge. And it's also, there's a process. You can't just go and tear it down just because you want to, because it's ugly and it looks bad. You know, you have to give notice to the owner of the property. Um, and people aren't, you know, just like, you know, certified male people are not trying to get notice of nothing bad. You know, when you try to serve them with something like that, they're not trying to do that. They're not trying to get that. And so, um, and they will often transfer the property into another name. And so you got to start over and it sets you back. And so people, you know, know and play those games. And so, um, you know, we, that, that's sort of what we work, you know, we're working against as well. But, we, you know, we are trying our best. And, you know, for any vacant properties, any, any long time properties, you know, please bring that to my attention. Uh, you know, anywhere in the ward, uh, or if you see some somewhere else, you know, you know, sometimes I see things in, uh, in other wards or people, you know, you have relatives and friends and they live in other wards and they'll call you instead of calling their council person. And we will make sure to share the information. Uh, so we know, you know, we got challenges, but there's some things that, um, you know, I want to highlight uh, that are, are really good in our community. And, uh, you know, these last couple of weeks have been really good in, in Ward 5. You know, I mentioned Harding Park, um, you know, and that's going to be great for the community. Uh, and I'm you know, looking forward to next year when we can do um, some, you know, real some serious programming over there in that neighborhood. Uh, um, you know, on a, on a downside in that neighborhood, uh, we are probably going to lose Willow Elementary School. Um, many of you have heard of uh, decisions made by the school district regarding the closing of high schools. And that's a, that's a very challenging situation. You know, uh, the reality is that we have more buildings than we have students. You know, the mighty, you know, big uh, Cleveland School District we once had, you know, is, is down to less than well, a little over 30,000 students, I think. Uh, a little over 30,000 students, high school uh, students in the Cleveland School District. And so it's very hard to justify having a building where you got 200 students. When you look at what it costs to run a building, operate a building, heat a building, or cool a building, um, um, and, and pay for utilities, it, it's hard to justify that cost. And so there's some very, very hard decisions, you know, that the district is recommending. And I know for a lot of those, um, um, you know, we're not happy about those. Um, I know East Tech is not one of the schools slated to be closed. Yeah, I'm glad about that. But, um, you know, I feel bad for, you know, the other neighborhoods because it leaves a void. It, it really leaves a void. And so, you know, um, we have to, you know, figure out you know, what's best for the community, what's best for the children, what's best for the district, and what's best for our neighborhoods. And so how do we repurpose those buildings that are closed, um, you know, or secure them, or can we get them torn down and maybe um, market that as another developable site? So, you know, these are, you know, some of the other decisions that we're faced with. Uh, but, um, Again, I mentioned we had a, we had a really uh, a good couple of weeks in, in, in Ward 5. And I don't know if, if any of you here were at the ribbon cutting for the box five. But that was a, a, a great event. Um, I think TV20 was there, so it'll be on TV, TV20 soon. And I think some of the news stations were there as well. But, uh, for those uh, of you who don't know, it's a, a retail center, a small retail center built out of shipping containers. And this is a brainchild of uh, Mr. Tramboy Burton Bell Carr. And uh, it is really phenomenal. It's, I, it's, it's striking, it's iconic. And 
you know, uh, it, it's beautiful. And if you go by at night, it, it's really, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's something. It's something to behold. But it's all, you know, what's even more important is that it's giving business people in this community, small business people in our community, retail and office space that they can afford. You know, with small businesses, they don't have access to the capital um, that larger businesses have. And so this gives them an opportunity and an attractive space where they, people can come and buy their goods and services and, and meet with them. Um, and they can afford to, in turn, reinvest in their business and eventually grow. And I, I think the notion is some of them, you know, eventually they will grow out of the box spot because they'll be doing so well they'll be able to get a larger space in another area, and then we can bring someone else in. So again, it's just a great program, and I just want to give a real big kudos to Mr. Trammell for Oh, I also want to mention um, uh, the radio station, WOVU. Uh, you know, we have the only community radio station. And it's in the shopping center, and you know a lot of people from all over the city come and, and and use the radio station and do programming on the radio station. And it's really a place where people can come and learn um, not only the on-air aspects but also the technical and production aspects. So again, it's a great vehicle for the community. Another um, skill building um, tool that you know we have in our belt. And so again, I'm just very proud of. Uh, WOVU 95.9 FM on the radio. But Tim won't let me get my own show. <laughs> okay, um, you know, we have the restaurant there um, also. Uh, for years it was Bridgeport Cafe, and Burton Bill Carr got out of the restaurant business late last year, and um, fortunately we had uh, people in the community who were interested in Mr. Akeen Africa and his brother Sean. What? When uh, his brother Sean, and, um, um, they are uh, the Angie, you know, the Angie's family. Uh, Angie's, um, you know, I think it was their mother, or, and uh, they have Zanzibar uh, restaurant in Shaker Square and um, Zanzibar downtown. So they are already experienced restaurant tours, and um, um, they had an interest in in reinvesting in the neighborhood, and so that is that is such a wonderful thing. And uh, I'm grateful to that. I'm grateful for that. Um, and I wanted to, um, you know, we've got some other projects. I'm going to cut it, cut it kind of short um, because I got a list of things I wanted to, the projects I wanted to highlight. And if I had had my technology right, I would have had, you know, drawings and renderings that you could look at at your own leisure. But, you know, we've got some real cool things coming. Um, we're going to be building homes on Colfax Avenue. Um, I don't know if we're going to break ground this year. In the spring, okay, in the spring on Colfax Avenue, uh, 28 homes, 28 homes. Um, they're gonna be beautiful. Um, we got housing coming to Midtown on Euclid Avenue. Uh, as you know, I, I have part of Midtown uh, from East 55th on the south side up to East 77th, the Aldi, including the Aldi. So that, that's, you know, that's how far War 5 extends. And so we got, you know, housing coming there in, in Midtown. Um, we got a project, the um, the Warner Swayze building, um, right on 46 in Carnegie, that, that big hulking monstrosity. Um, and we actually had a developer under contract for a couple of years, and they've been doing some due diligence and some structural work. And um, um, they really feel good that they, they will be able to do something, you know, with that property, either with the building or, or without it. But, um, you know, it's a great site. It's uh, you know, right on 55th and Carnegie. I'm 55th and Carnegie, not 46. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great location. And if they're not able to repurpose the building, that's a great prime piece of land. So we got some significant opportunities there. Now we're looking at um, uh, what to do with the juvenile, the old juvenile court building, you know, with the campus district. Um, you know, we had a lot of, fits and starts with that, and so, so we were at a point where we have to make some decisions on the future of the building itself. Um, you know, we got interest um, from some people who want to put movies, a movie studio in the ward. And so, uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of ideas, a lot of people fighting, and you know, I'll say more about those when I've got more information that I can really share with you. Um, but, um, 
what I'll, I'll close with is um, another property that I'm really just very, very happy about, a project I'm happy about, and that's the uh, Sloppy Village Gateway. <laughs> Some of you may have seen it um, uh, on social media. Uh, if you haven't, you know, go, go to social media, media, go to University Settlements um, Facebook page. Um, uh, and again, we, this is the first significant development in North Broadway since St. Michael St. Michael's Hospital left the community. Um, it is, it is uh, University Settlement is one of our oldest settlement houses, and uh, along with Friendly Inn, and um, they're at 49th and Broadway in, in a property that doesn't really serve their mission well and serve their um, their clients well. And Earl just you know came with this idea one day, and it was like, by the time he came to me, it's like, it's already, the train was already moving. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute, hold up, let me jump on. <laughs> but it, um, you, know, what they, you know, what it will be um, is a, a beautiful building right on Broadway in the St. Michael's Hospital site with uh, University Settlements offices and campus on the first floor. And how many? 90, 90, 90 um, units of affordable housing um, um, on the upper three floors, as well as a, a couple of townhouses in, in the community. And so it is, the renderings are beautiful. It's gonna be such a striking, a striking uh, development right on, right on Broadway. And it's, it's gonna, well, it's already, um, there's, always, there, uh, there's already a lot of interest in Broadway, and I've been telling people that it's just that it's a matter of timing. And you know, when I first got in office, uh, I kind of learned from what happened to Central. Some things have to happen. You almost have to bottom out, for lack of a better word. But you need to have, because you're going to need a, a, a fresh slate of land to work with. And it's, it's difficult for people in the community. It's hard to live through. It's hard to live through. But you know, once you go through that process, you've got land, you've got developers, you've got vision, you've got ideas. And I think our biggest problem is going to be managing the growth and the investment in, in the neighborhood, Earl. That, that's my concern. Um, because uh, the one thing I, I believe in and, and what I learned from the mayor is you know, we can invest in the neighborhood, but we do not displace people. And so whatever we do in the neighborhood, we want to make it good for it. not just the new people coming in, but for the people who stay. And so, you know, that's my commitment. Um, opportunity quarter, last thing. Okay, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be nice about it because it's, it's, it's happening. But um, you know, we know, you know, how the community felt about it. Um, the community didn't, fa wasn't in favor of it. Um, the people felt like. Um, this was just another one of those projects that's going to be for other people, and people in the community aren't going to get any benefit from it. You know, opportunity for whom? That that was my my favorite line, and so the road is is paid for. The road is done pretty much. Um, it's in phase three. You know, it, it'll they'll complete construction in 2021 or 22 or 23 or whatever. But it's paid for. It's done. The contractor closing is, is there and. The subcontractors are all in place, and, and that's moving on, and that's fine. But you know, the real question is, what about the surrounding neighborhood? That's how they sold it to the community that this is going to help your neighborhood. When we put this roadway in, it's going to help you. It's going to bring housing. It's going to bring jobs. It's going to bring development. It's going to bring investment. And then um, the state made no commitment to any, any of those things. And so, and I. I you know, I, I have to say that every time I get a chance to talk about it. Um, but we are working, nevertheless, in our neighborhoods. You know, we already had plans. We were already working, and we never stopped doing what we thought was right for our communities. And so, um, and, you know, in Fairfax, um, they're doing great things. Uh, in, in our part of Opportunity Corridor, well, actually the biggest part, which is, you know, both parts are Kinsman and, and the highest and the Slavic Village. Slavic Village are both in my ward. And so we're we're going ahead with that plan. Uh, what we what the people in the community want to see. And so with Hyacinth, you know, we don't have anything definite yet. Um, uh, we're looking at transit-oriented development, and that means uh, development 
uh, in light of the rapid station there, because that that's going to be a big hub, an even bigger hub, you know, especially once the roadway is complete. And what we're doing now is engaging in a process, a very exciting exciting process in the Slavic Village community uh, of building an, an eco district, um, uh, a, a neighborhood founded on the principles of equity, uh, resilience, and climate control. And again, it's a very exciting process, and we're training residents. We'll be training residents in, in, in those principles as well. And everyone together will plan for the future of the neighborhood. And so I, I, I just really look forward to that process. Um, let me uh, backtrack for a minute, uh, Ms. Armstrong. Um, the director, Friendly Ann, um, I, I just want to say, not acknowledge her as well, and I didn't do that earlier. So. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, the technology kind of, you know, the glitches kind of threw me off, uh, you know, because otherwise I'd have been flowing. And but I, I just wanted to share with you my view, uh, you know, what I've been doing, you know, what we've been doing, and the important work going on. But also just to come back to you and say thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for your your good wishes. Um, I even say thank you to the haters because they keep you on your game. They keep you on your game. You know, and I mean, you all have been, treated me exceptionally well, and I, I certainly appreciate that, and um, I'm just asking you to, um, let's stay the course. You know, if we can all dig a little deeper and do just a little bit more, you know, I think we can really advance this neighborhood and this ward. Um, you know, not just Central, but, you know, Broadway. This is Broadway's time. You know, I firmly believe that. And Midtown. And Downtown. And the Campus District. You know, these are all a part, this is all a part of Ward 5. And Kinsman Garden Valley. You know, we got great things going on in all the neighborhoods. And so, um, you know, I, I just feel so privileged to be your leader at this time, at this juncture in history. Um, uh, we got some pretty exciting things coming. Um, you know, stay tuned. Uh, uh, stay with me, and uh, I want to say thank you to my, you know, my crew, uh, Gerald, uh, Sherry, uh, Scott, and David, um, hey Deborah. <laughs> uh, Brenda couldn't be here today; she's a little under the weather. Um, but a special thank you. You know, when you got a, a crew of people who work with you and for you, and are determined to never let you fall or fail. You know, uh, you know, God is really blessing you. So I'm, I'm grateful for all you do and all your hard work. Everybody who came out today took the time out to come. Uh, I thank you for being here. Please go back and share the word, share the message, something that you heard today with somebody else in the community. Hope you can inspire them to come out and and be a part of what we're doing. Um, next month we will be here on our regular second Saturday for War Club. So y'all, you can bring your questions. In. Bring your questions in. We'll you know, be back in our regular format. And in December, as you all know, is our annual holiday party. You know, I, I think we got the best party. Uh, yeah, Kevin, we got the best party. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, we, we look forward to you being there, and we we can certainly use some volunteers to help us, you know, finish putting that together. So, if you're interested, please say something to Sherry. Um, uh, before you leave, or give her or me a call later on. But again, I, I'm, and uh, finally, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Joe Black, uh, Mr. Black. Uh, he's a great young man, uh, doing a lot of great work here in in our community. Um, you know, he's one of those people that, you know, I, I know our city's going to be in good hands when we do finally get out of the way. Um, but uh, he, he works for the Sisters of Charity, who's one of our great partners. And so, um, and he agreed to act as moderator. Uh, although, again, we kind of got thrown off by um, the technology glitch. But I want to say thank you to him. And, and thank you, Priscilla, thank you. She's always, you know, always there to help out, uh, no matter what we ask her to do. And to everybody else, you know, again, thank you so much. Um, and. This concludes my state of the war.
us continue to clap for our councilwoman. So today we had the opportunity to hear a number of things specific to our war. We heard about our safety concerns and challenges. We heard about food access, both the challenge and the opportunities. The current legislative work and some of the things that are on the upcoming agenda, as well as some of the development. Those are all things that we can attribute to our collective work and to your leadership, and so for that, we thank you. With that being said, I just want to give you a quick example of some of the work that I'm involved with. And I, I say that to say that as I begin to think strategically about an action, we often ask ourselves why. And I challenge myself and my team to continue to ask why until we can no longer ask that question. And that's how we drive to solutions. Today, I'll flip that and I'll say, we ask ourselves, who am I? And if you ask yourself that enough, you begin to get to the core of who you are. So as I listened to my councilwoman today, I said, who is Councilwoman Phyllis Clee? A servant, a resident, a leader, a Case Western Reserve University grad, a scarab, a lawyer, a reader, a mother, a friend, and our councilwoman. When I think about our war, who and what is our war? Diverse, strong, evolving, and anchored to the city. Historic, full of amazing resources, and full of phenomenal people. It is who we are and what we are that will drive us to the next phase of our future war. And so it is our journey to work together to make this world what we believe it is and what we know it is. For that, I thank you all. Refreshments are available in the back. Thank you.